I thought what we'd do is I'll, I'd share some perspectives with you and then perhaps towards the end of the session we can have a bit of a conversation, maybe do a bit of a scenario hack and, um, and see uh, what we can learn. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to share with you some of the work that we've done. So I, I think the important thing just to put an emphasis on this is that we are talking of course about, as we say in futures, a time yet to come. And the, the, the big dilemma is this notion of our, our relationship with time and you know whether we're thinking of the future as an incremental version of today or as something completely different or as something in between. And the truth is everybody's got a view and there are a million things you can say about this. So the, the best we can really do is try and frame the dialogue and, and you can then debate on, on how we frame it or not. Uh, many of you are familiar with the idea of deja vu. Deja vu is the idea that you, you come across a, a, a problem or a challenge like higher education and, and you have the sense that you've seen this before. So Bouja Day, a little idea that was uh, developed by, the, by a stand-up comedian and adopted by the banking community in London, and surprisingly turned out to have a sense of humor, uh, which we also hope you will have today, is the idea that you know, you come across a problem and you know that you've seen it before. It's not that you have a sense that you've seen it before. You know, but, and here's an important but, you're looking at it as if it is, in fact, the first time that you come across it. In other words, if you are coming at higher education as if it is the first time that you saw it, the alien from space example is always a good idea. Or, you know, the, the first generation student at the university is another good example. You're coming at this as if it is the first time that you're seeing it. How might it strike you then? What would you notice? It starts to create the space in the mind where you can think a bit differently about what's going on. I thought I'd share a little bit, just a few principles of futures, if that's okay with you. Are you comfortable with that? Otherwise, our conversation is not going to make a lot of sense to you. So, as futurists, we say that those who know where they come from also know their past. In other words, we don't subscribe to the idea that those who know where they come from know their future. Because if that were true, then the best futurists in the world would be historians. This is a very sensitive issue. So this is a very important principle for how you think about the future. Because the future is not the past plus 12% a year. So, so our argument is that, I've spoken a little bit about our relationship with time, and, and our view is that time will in fact not tell. It is much more, as this slide suggests, the future from, and there are many perspectives on future. Our perspective, certainly at our institute, is that the future is something that you decide, not something that you predict. And I thought what I would just do very briefly is just touch a little bit on some key paradigms. This is some work that we're doing at the moment. We often hear people talking about a paradigm shift and then we say, what do you mean? And they, they don't know beyond that. So on the ontological paradigm has, has really kind of uh, got two dimensions. It, it's about origins and definitions. And in other words, if you think about higher education, what is the origin of higher education? I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And what is the definition of higher education? What is it? The epistemological paradigm is extremely important for higher education because this is about the nature of knowledge. The axiological paradigm uh, has, has two dimensions, and that is, I'm sure that people, folks from the philosophy department will get a heart attack if they, if they see me riding roughshod over their, their very delicate concepts. I'm sure they do at least a month on each one of these. Um, the, the axiological paradigm, to my mind, has two key dimensions, and that is ethics and aesthetics. And the second one is aesthetics, and that is what's elegant. One of my particular areas of interest What's elegant? What is attractive? What is beautiful? It's from the Greek doxa, belief. Sorry. Um, so, so this is about our belief system. The teleological paradigm, um, that is in the immortal words of the Spice Girls, what you really, really want. And the things that you want will impact the decisions you make and that will shape your future. 
So this starts to get us now to a very interesting idea in futures, which is this distinction between what we call explorative futures on the one hand and normative futures on the other. Explorative futures is this idea that we debate and we think about what might be coming. We're just exploring what could be coming. Normative futures is what we want. And these two things are not always the same thing. The eschatological paradigm, this is really from the study of theology, and I'm not a theologian, and I know most of you are not surprised by that at all. Um, but the, the eschatological paradigm is really the how will this all end? Why is this important? Because people often work towards what they think the end is going to be anyway. And in the Minerva logical, that's, there's a spelling error there. Uh, I just uh, coined that from the, from the um, Roman goddess Minerva, who is the goddess, among other things, of creativity. What, what do we think is the nature of creativity and its relationship with innovation? Is, are we a place of creativity and innovation, or are we a place that tells people the stuff that's, that's already been discovered? So this is just a little bit of work we're trying to bring some of the stuff together. So when we talk about shifting the paradigm, this is some of the stuff we might be talking about. So, so there's a frame of, of, kind of paradigms that I think may be a useful place to start. Um, and it may help us to shape the conversation and drive it forward, which is, of course, all that we're interested in. Can I just say again? You know, we are coming at this from a sort of unashamedly futures perspective. So there may be many other perspectives that we don't bring. Yeah? So we're not trying to pretend in this little session that this is the answer to everything. This is just a futures lens on it. There may be many other insights to this thing, like let's say operationalizing it, about which I would know absolutely nothing about. Yeah? So let me just admit the limits of my my understanding of my contribution here is academic humility demands us to do at the university. Okay, here's a very good example of an academic paradigm. Write a wise saying or a wise article and your name will live forever. Okay, so you can think about this from many perspectives and, and this is just a sort of obvious uh, hierarchy. Um, it's, it's always uh, useful to have your own triangle in a presentation. Um, people think you've actually thought about it. Um, so, of course, there are personal ambitions of researchers, professors, and you know there are discipline issues. You know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, forensic scientist, or I'm a educationalist, or I'm a, you know, whatever it might be. There's an institutional dimension to this. You know, so this, you know, the let's say University of South Africa or higher education. Uh, department, or you know, University of Stellenbosch, or UCT, or the internationalization guys, or, or whatever it is. There's a sort of socio-cultural dimension to this. Um, <clears throat> you know, what is a university in Africa, for example, and is that different from anywhere else? There's a local or municipal thing we hear at the School for Public Leadership, and they concern themselves with what's happening very much at a local level. There, you know, obviously, provincial, national, regional, continental, global, and um, and I left out the universe there. Let's, uh, let's then think about some paradigms. I spoke about this paper I did in Madrid a few weeks ago, and uh, <clears throat> well, they, they were, it struck me that a lot of the business that presented there you know, really came at this thing from a very Western perspective, and it's interesting um, how well the developed countries responded to this slide um, of the idea that social dynamics shape Africa in a very interesting way. So, so there are many perspectives on this. This is just one perspective, and it says that you know one of the ways to think about the societies of the West is that you know it, there's a centuries-old uh, system of rule of law that gives the framework for economics within which politics flourishes and politics produces these leaders that make sure that the rule of law system seems to survive. It's one way of thinking about it. Um, it's just one perspective. In the African context, one of the ways that you can think about this is that we have a rise in leadership. People seem to be forming bodies with leaders, rebel movements, uh, new political parties, and so on emerge all the time. That creates a certain character of politics, uh, very often a very volatile uh, environment. The politics then, depending on who wins, uh, shapes the economics. 
And that gives, um, that often gives us the, the idea that Africa needs more control, rather than the order that has come over centuries. What is the implication of this for the future of higher education uh, on this continent? Well, what worries me is that we seem to be starting with the control element. So I spoke, so that really struck me as a, like, why start there with internationalization when, when you know, knowledge can be such an exciting multinational thing. But anyway, okay, so just a, a bit more context. A few assumptions on, 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 uh, um, on where we're going with this um, futures idea. Maybe just from a strategic perspective, structure follows strategic intent. That's a really important principle. So if you don't know what it is that your intention is, don't start with structuring yourself. Mm. When we look for intent, it doesn't mean that we're, we're trying to criticize the present. That's, again, the problem with decolonization. The search for intent does not imply that you start with the problem today. In other words, you can say, what do I want from the future, without necessarily saying the problem today. It's like, we know, of course, that we, we're not going to debate the ideas of excellence and quality and financial sustainability. You know, even at the IFR, we live in the real world. Okay? Um, we, we must have a positive expectation, of course. You, you know, the, our philosophy of the future is you don't, def it's, the future is not something you defend yourself against. This is part of the debate, the worry of decolonization, because the moment you introduce it, you get people to defend themselves. Mm. Language has us while we have language. In other words, people like to debate the definition of things, particularly at universities. We've already said that it cannot be predicted, but probabilities are in fact discernible and we can make decisions. I think we've made that point. More than one future is possible. So, so we always believe that. More than one future is always possible. Right, so number 10, uh, everyone has a pet theory. Gosh, we really pushed ourselves here. Uh, people will selectively and simul but simultaneously resist and lament the pace of change. What I mean by this is, in the one area, they'll say, oh, come on, isn't it time for a change? And then in the other area, they'll say, seriously, you want to change this? We hold this dear. This is the dichotomy of humans. People will also selectively and simultaneously resist and lament the level of complexity, to support your point, David. The whole thing is structured to make it look like it looks today, mm. not tomorrow. It's been designed for decades to make it look exactly the way it works today. So, so then we went to the ontological paradigm and we said, well, what is a university? What is it? And this comes from the what many consider to be, I'll talk about that later, the world's first university, Bologna, where they described it as a universitas, that means a, the universe, a uh, universe of ideas in which we have masters and students, teachers and students. A universe or a community in which there are teachers, masters, and students, learners. And if we can link this to Paulo Freire's idea of, you know, the pedagogy of freedom, the pedagogy of the oppressed, it is a universe in which the masters are also students. In other words, the guys who teach are doing research in modern terms. They're learning all the time, discovering new things. And the students are also masters in two senses. One, in the sense that they are continuously mastering new things. And two, that the student is teacher to the master. Okay, okay. So, so that's one way of thinking about a, defini a definition of university. And maybe if we like that, then we say, well, whatever the future university will be, it has to be a community. So we have to design and structure it in such a way that it is a community. And it has to be a place where some ambition for mastery will take place. And maybe there are people who teach. And there are people who learn. And maybe we have to make sure that it's designed in such a way that those who are teaching are learning and those who are learning are teaching. 
So already, I think this starts to open up some ideas of what could a really exciting university look like. <laughs> I did a very practical experiment at the conference of international universities last uh, last week. I said to them, put your hand up. There are about 120 people in the room. I said, put your hand up if you if you work in the area that you studied at university. Four people in the room put their hands up. So that makes me wonder, this thing that we're producing, you know, think about the language of producing people. I mean, how bad is that? We're producing people who can work it. When out of the 120 people in the room, four people are working in the thing they studied. Mm. So I think it's a very interesting question that you pose. What is the case? What is the case? Is it just that, you know, we don't want to die? Or is it some other thing we want to do? And I think that's a really important question because I think that's a more futures-based approach. Staying relevant is the, the problem is we're going to die if we don't. It's problem-based. So, so then if we think about what's the role of universities, if we, if we do have this community of masters and, and students and students are masters and masters are students, it's difficult to get away from these kind of three things. Um, sorry, I think it was copied from another deck, and so the, the, the words are mangled. So, I think we have to have research. Research helps the masters to be students. It's one of the ways in which you learn. You research, you learn new things. We, we must obviously have teaching and learning. The masters have to teach, but the students also have to learn. It's not always the same thing, as we all know. And then, of course, we want, we're somewhere in a society, as we have recently discovered. So, what can universities do? That, for example, corporates can't, or NGOs can't. There's bits of research that never find their way into teaching. But if we were a corporate, we would never allow that to happen. That a piece of research would just disappear. Especially if it had taken three to five years. You know? Gosh, you couldn't afford it. Somehow, as universities, we can. There's a... this this. Process I, I, I told you about the, the African uh, Future of African Knowledge Society. Um, you know, the, over a hundred people graduated with a master's degree from that program in the last few years, and that research is where. Who knows? The output seems to be the degree, and I'm just wondering. That's not an outdated. It's almost like the output of the meeting is the minutes. Yeah. yeah. That's that's without, not true at all. Without action items. Yeah. yeah. No, no. It's like the output is the list of action items, not the actions. Mm. So this little circle here, it turns out, is a pretty important one, right? To what degree is that research? Which is literally, that's a few rand. Filtering into, let's say, technology teaching. How is that impacting our society? Or is it just sitting on the hill there? And what are we learning from that society that's informing our research? Or are these things really fragmented, disjointed? There's a professor with slides here. There's some amazing research there. Oh yes, there's a society on the outside as well. To what degree are they sort of integrated? Yeah. So I agree with, with, with you to some degree. And I said that you know maybe structured methods of inquiry or scientific inquiry methods, maybe that's our USP. What's um, interesting, can I can yeah. just I'd be curious to you, like the, the emergence of the CLO, mm. you know, which is a fascinating thing for me, and yeah. is the chief learning officer in big companies are yeah. starting to gain traction. It's quite big in the States already. Yeah. Just thought I'd say one or two things about this African idea. I've, I've mentioned some of it, so so I'll just say briefly. I, I wonder to what extent we're actually, when we're decolonizing, for example, to what extent are we celebrating the uh, the knowledge society of Africa? And so I'm just highlighting just a few examples. The Gears Scrolls from Axum in the, the former Ethiopia, Eritrea area, um, you know, that had language, for example, um, 
already in the third century, um, written language quite well developed. Um, it was an empire with its own alphabet. Um, and what very important to me, it was it was a link, this place, between the trading systems of the Mediterranean and the Asiatic world, and shows the extent of international commerce at the time. So a real hub, and I, you know, I'm wondering what happened that Africa became so insular and self-referencing. So, so this is just a sort of interesting example of learning in Africa from the history of Africa. And this is, um, I think we forget often that here was an astonishing institute of Alexandria. Um, you know, lecture halls, laboratories, guest rooms. Um, among others, some of the visiting fellows included Archimedes and, and Euclid, the astronomer Aristarchus. Um, had this astonishing library, of course, that we all know. And here's a sort of a, you know, random little fact about Aristophanes, who did that remarkable measurement of the Earth. So, so with the Gears scrolls, with the Museum at Alexander, in addition to that, I, I like the, um, the bit of history around Hippo of, um, or rather, Augustine, Saint Augustine of Hippo, um, in Algeria. And the work, and he worked from a theological perspective, but he produced, among other things, notions around rational beings possessing free will, worked on just war theory, and this was around the 5th century. So I, I guess I'm just asking about how well are we celebrating the rich knowledge history of Africa, and why are we decolonizing? Why is that the thing? When we have all this amazing stuff, um, here's another example. UNESCO says that Bologna was in fact perhaps not the first university. Speaking to a colleague from uh, from Morocco um, this week in Nairobi, and they were excited to that someone remembered this idea that, that the oldest university is Al Karouin in, in Fez in Morocco, founded in 1859 maybe. It turned out this was not an aberration. Because a hundred years later in Cairo we had Al Azhar University. This was a hundred years before we had Bologna. But I, I think that from an artifactual perspective and from a whole design <coughs> perspective, I agree with you. I think there's a lot of work that we can and should do. And I think people would appreciate it, even a primitive attempt. I agree with you, David. It can often seem a bit stilted and fakey, and, but I think it's. It's almost okay if you acknowledge that that's where you're starting. That's not that's not the thing you're going to do now. It's part of your little journey to learn about engaging in this culture. Okay, so quite I'm laying a, like a lot of foundation here. It's just you can see I'm avoiding the thing that says this will be what universities will be like. I'm I'm, I'm trying to delay that as long as possible in our conversation. So yes, I was just going to say it would be a, another almost millennium until Africa would have its next university, um, and then of course we had we had a few others. Uh, but but so that was 1827. Then about 30 years later, we had of course the, the Berlin Conference, where literally leaders of Western uh, countries got together and chopped up Africa like it was its own special pizza, and with utter disregard for the flow of uh, indigenous knowledge. Um, without any insight of the deep knowledge that already existed here, and really segmented the place into oblivion. Then about 50 years later, um, uh, Jean-Marc Cotet, a famous French uh, artist, was asked to present what education might look like in 2000. <laughs> this was in 1900. And uh, this is one of, the, one of the things that he came up with. And you can see it's very interesting that it's actually not that far removed from Elon Musk's idea uh, that there will be a mesh implant at the base of your skull okay, um, and you will simply uh, you know, download whatever you need to know. Um, okay, um, so then maybe let, let me uh, jump ahead uh, another hundred years to May 2000 and refer to that Bible of the modern society, The Economist. Uh, and they referred to Africa uh, in May 2000 as the hopeless continent. But a, a, a decade later, the Economist uh, changes its mind. This is Africa rising. A year later, time in a rare display of an utter lack of uh, creativity copies the Economist title. Um, 
A year after that, they, they talk about aspiring Africa. It's not just rising now, there's hope. The middle class is growing, depending on how you define middle class, more than $2 a day, God help the middle class of Africa. And then in April 2016, making Africa work, a much more pragmatic view, much more incorporation of technology conversation in that issue. Um, and then later that year, and I think the most recent uh, version of that, Africa's Fragile Democracies, um, an implication that uh, that may have. But, but it is at least uh, the kind of problem that perhaps we'd like to grapple with. Um, and I thought I'd just share that with you just to get another perspective on our continent and our context and where we are and where we might be going. And of course that context is also informed here at, let's say, Stellenbosch University with the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, Agenda 2063, sorry, I don't know why the computer's doing that, that says Agenda 2063, which is the AU's very long-term future plan. So, so this is the... Um, Sustainable Development Goals by the UN, and number four there is on quality education, and I just brought out one reference for you, uh, the intention is by 2020, substantially expand globally the number of scholarships for developing countries. In Agenda 2063, the AU's plan, they have these seven uh, African aspirations, one of them is in Africa whose development is in fact people-driven, relying on the potential offered by people. So I just thought I'd share with you just some of those big blocks, the Sustainable Development Goals, the African Agenda 2063, the Sustainable Development Goals, just so that we can put higher education also in that broader context. And then um, my concluding thought uh, before tea is this very exciting idea, which I was extremely pleased to share in, in Nairobi this week, that academic freedom and freedom of scientific research is ensconced in the Constitution of South Africa. So colleagues, um, I know admittedly a very broad landscape that I shared with you in our first part of the conversation here. What makes this thing so challenging is that I think what's happening, we're in that liminal space right now between the academy as we've known it for a thousand years and the emerging needs, not emerging, the very pressing needs of the university of 2020 and beyond. And I think that one of the fundamental differences over and above decolonization and all of these other things is that what we have in our leadership right now is really smart people, very astute, highly decorated scholars and, and folks that have done some significant time in the commercial sector as well, but they're chiefly scholars. They have a scholarly track yeah. and at their own admission is the vice chancellor's broadly, and I'm sure that's changing literally as we speak, as, as tenure comes to an end and new people come in, I would imagine that any university who's got who, who's, uh, got their head screwed on will be paying attention to the, the, the business acumen and the leadership qualities of the incoming VC and others yeah. as a way to, to shock absorb this yeah. very radical deal there. You know, so the mindset is a dangerous thing, and you know, I spoke about the power of imagination and how important it is to imagine what higher education could be. If we were to design, for example, the ideal university, what might, might that be? And Einstein's idea has significant implications for the future of universities, because if we are peddlers of knowledge, if, we're, if we've set up a knowledge shop, and we now know that you know you, you carry your knowledge in your pocket for the moment, anyway. Then I think this has very serious risks for universities. If that's what we do, uh, we sell outdated knowledge, or even current knowledge, because this is pretty current. Then I think we're going to be in trouble. Um, and so you know, imagination is, I think. And if you want to make, start making a list here, discernment is on that list, imagination is on that list. Einstein continues to say your imagination is your preview of life coming in fact. So if you don't imagine what's coming, it's going to be weak. Mm. Then the policy guy in Pretoria is imagining this for you. God help us. <laughs> so in addition to discernment and imagination, um, another important one is going to be curiosity. This is the Mars rover, Curiosity. 
What, what you ask, when you ask people anecdotally, what did you learn at university? The answers to those questions in the bar may very well be some of the core products of universities in the future. Because corporates are very unlikely to study the nature of discernment, the nature of imagination, and the nature of curiosity. It's not in their nature to study such things. So if we now start to think, what is it that universities can do that most other entities in the society cannot do with structured methods of inquiry from multiple partial perspectives, then the things that people actually get from their university education may in fact be the things that universities actually teach in the future. Of course there are technical skills, but it's, it's serious implications if you're carrying it around in your pocket. So that's, um, in addition to discernment, imagination, curiosity, of course, is the idea of connection. And I would say that because systems thinking is a subject I really love, and, and this is a great example of, of connection. Um, some of you may recognize this guy, a guy called Will I Am. Maybe the wrong demographic here, I don't know. How do you know who this guy is? Uh, doesn't ring a bell. Uh, Black Eyed Peas, does that mean anything to you? Um, he wrote a song called Let's Get Retarded. No, doesn't mean anything to you. Uh, it's a bit of a superfluous call in some of the classes we teach. But um, why am I putting him up there? Because about five years ago, he became the global director of innovation at Intel. Now, 30 years ago, you, you would classify things, right? You would say, that's high technology, that's Intel, that's popular music. But in the late 80s, an astonishing thing happened around connection in the world. And we became less interested in, in segmentation, segregation, and taxonomy, and much more interested in connection, interconnection, connectedness. And why would Intel make this connection? Because there's power in that insight. Because they know that the guy who's sitting inside Intel in the laboratory is less likely to look outside Intel than Will I Am is. Will I Am has a different lens on the on the society. So in addition to discernment, imagination, and curiosity, I think connection is another thing that universities may, in fact, help the society with in the future. And that includes a conceptual connection like this, but it may also include a social connection. The nature of how the future evolves is interesting. It's, not, it's really not linear and incremental. It's literally not 12% a year minus 8% cost. It's, it's non-linear. It's disruptive. You all have heard that word to ad nauseum. And, and the sort of obvious examples is, are that you know, a car is not a faster horse. You don't get to the car by filing the nails of the horse. Or washing its tail better. So you don't get to the future of universities by appointing a slightly younger professor. So Google is not just the online version of the yellow pages. It's a very important principle. If the university of the future is going to be online, or at least partially online, it's not going to be the online yellow page version. This is a very important principle as we now get to technology. So perhaps we've had some of the societal conversation, but if we think about what, what are the sector, where where is our change in our society going to come from? I've told you I have I have absolutely no hope for government, and maybe we shouldn't anyway, and it's not their fault. Labour is too partisan. They're not changing society. They're interested in membership benefits. Business I'm going to get to. What about the media? The media doesn't necessarily actively change the society. They comment on, they find stuff out, the good investigative versions thereof. But they don't, you don't read a proposal in the media. What about the clergy? They kind of pop up and then, you know, this is evil, it's against the wishes of God and so on. From time to time, I don't know how much they actually propose a new thing. They just sometimes say that's wrong. I'm not saying any of this is irrelevant. It's very important. I'm, not, I'm just saying it's not exactly designing the future. What about constitutional institutions? We call chapter 9 institutions here. Once again, they don't create the proposal. 
You just go to them if there's a problem. What about academia? Well, colleagues, I'm submitting to you that this is exactly what it is. Because we are the producers of new knowledge. We are creating the new version. That's us. I think, in partnership with my colleagues here, and maybe I would say that because I'm biased, because I have one foot in each, but I really do think that business, for all its many faults, is at least future-oriented. It is at least growth-oriented. I know that also has its limitations. By the way, that's where the IFR started, with the Club of Rome's first report in 1968, Limits to Growth. So I think one of, in one of the scenarios, business and, and academia work a lot closer together. Academia creates neutral platforms for dialogue that allow for emergence to occur, as you've suggested to us. <clears throat> I, I've spoken about the USP, and I, I won't um, embellish on that. I, I just do think that we are students of, of lots of information. We must be students of knowledge, of course, but indeed generators of knowledge um, so that we can help our, our students and our society make sense of it uh, in the interest of wisdom. And, and maybe it's a little bit um, philosophical and, you know, I kind of sense a move towards a more practical application. So let me, uh, let me keep uh, moving on. I'm not going to ask all these questions because, I, you know, maybe we've, we've heard from them uh, enough, but maybe I can talk about uh, one or two of them. Uh, let, let's look at number five. What are we learning from our skunk works through experimentation and rapid prototype? A lot of uh, highly innovative organizations, I'm talking about big multinationals, have this idea um, made popular in the writings of Singularity University, particularly in exponential organizations have this idea that they have a play pen outside the main business, which is also a business, but it's, it's like a laboratory, where they play with ideas for the business, and then they gently drip those ideas into the mainstream, not all at once, and they don't put this thing inside the business because then, as Salim Ishmael says, the antibodies kick in. So I just wonder if the university has a play pen, a skunk works, where it's, it's playing the model version of what a future university might be, and then dripping those ideas gently back into the bigger system. And I think leading universities of the future will have such things. And then the sort of call to action is number eight here. What should we be designing? as evidence of our leading anticipatory com competence. So if we are the creators of new knowledge, we are the vanguards of things to come, the shining lights of the future, what is it that we are in fact creating to demonstrate the evidence of that? Or are we quite the opposite, saying, careful now, careful now, watch out, okay? remember, you know, these places are like that, that's how it is. What, what we'll do now, colleagues, is I'll, I'll, sh I'll talk you through some of the dimensions that uh, my colleague Doris Fulun at the back and I have been working on creating for the future of universities. And I'll talk about each one of them briefly, and then we're going to do a bit of a, uh, we're going to just hack a scenario process in 30 minutes. Um, so we said that, I'm just going to talk through each one of these briefly, and then, and then I'm going to ask you to do some work. So that first one there, we, we, in other words, our view is that these were some of the dominant drivers of the future of universities. There are many others. We presented them to you as sliders so that, so that uh, they present a series of continua leading either one way or the other. Let me just point out that they're not binary. So it's not that you have one or the other, it's really about the extent of the blend. So for example, we think that universities will always have face-to-face -face teaching. Okay, so let me talk through each one and then I'm gonna ask you to do some work. So, so that first one is how research intensive do you want your university to be? So in other words, this question says, how big a, a chunk of your resource allocation is for research? 
that will drive massively the future of your university. And as you can already see in the very first one, you can see that not all universities of the future will be the same. Can you see, colleagues, that the future of the university is not going to be a single thing? <coughs> can you see that there will be universities that will have 2% there and universities that will have 90% there? So to talk about the future of the university is actually a flawed bit of thinking. Can you see why it's important that you decide the future? And if you don't decide, if you don't decide, then the future happens to you. Okay, the next one for our South African University context. What about your rest of Africa footprint? We have said it's not an option that you don't have one, but you may disagree with me. But the next one there is digitization. And there we spoke about, are you going to take an incremental heuristic trial and error type approach as a university? Let's see, let's test, let's try this little thing online, let's learn from that, then, then let's go bigger. Or are you going to go aggressive and expansive? We're sick and tired of professors wishing to work at home. From now on, you are forced to work at home. Okay, the next one is internationalization beyond Africa. And you can see again, this is why the university of the future is a misnomer, because you will decide as a university. Some universities will do nothing outside of Africa, if they're in Africa. And some will be very aggressive. Then your internationalization, is it going to be a micro or macro? In other words, is it, is it just a little bit that you want to do, or do you want to take over plant? And then do you want single site or multi-site? So are you going to build this geographically in one place? based on, let's say, cultural difference, as we often say in African strategy. Then what we call context orientation. On the one hand here, you're discipline-based and academic investigator-initiated. What we mean by that is you retain this idea of the boxes in disciplines, essentially. You say there's a thing called medicine, there's a thing called law, there's a thing called business, there's a thing called... You know, science, there's a thing called arts and so on. Well, that's one way. But another way may be a much more context and issue driven approach to learning. So you say, look, the issue, the challenge, the opportunity lies outside the university. And that's what we want to work on. Students work on projects in the extreme version of this. The program is the project. I'm almost guaranteed there will be universities like this in the future. The next is, in terms of our brand and cultural Africanization, there's uh, what you were talking about, David. And I, I said here, is it for Africa or of Africa? And of course, it's a blend. The next one is uh, our value chain approach. And, and this is about, are we pushing our stuff down the value chain or up? <laughs> or are we are we inviting you in? Or are we doing both? Why is this important? We, we don't, this is really about our sensitivity. It's not just about saying, here we are, we're good, we're amazing, listen to us, come and do a course here, we'll tell you the truth of the universe. We want to engage with you, we want to pull from you, push towards you, pull from you, push towards you. Okay. The next one is student numbers. And, you know, is this about, on, this is the, the on-campus virtual balance. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? What do you want to be? Then the public-private focus. Are we a public university, for example? So, that means that we are leaning towards, in reality, being funded predominantly by funds from outside the government. So what makes us a public university? Okay. Then, mastige. Are we a mass institution or are we a prestige institution? Prestige, I think, is an illegal word now in South Africa, together with elite. And then, in terms of collaboration, and you can see, of course, these things are not distinct and separate, they're all connected, I understand that. Um, this is just one way of showing it visually. You know, are we, are we happy with our silos? 
or are we much more interested in a kind of innovation matrix type structure? Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. We're going to do a quick hack of a, of a scenario process. So there's a, there's a speed dimension. That's the time horizon. How quickly? Right? High, low. And there is a success dimension. High, low. So what does that mean? It means that in this scenario, very quickly you can see this was the right thing to do. Boom, off we go. This one here, it, it's going, but I, oh, it feels like a lot of work, but we know it's the right thing. This one here, it's just the, the lethargy is setting in, we're bleeding out. This one here, we try it, we shift resources, and we die. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell us how we got to each one of these scenarios in the future as a university. What did we do? So, so let's hear, perhaps we can start with um, the sudden death. Who was that? We made some really brilliant decisions. Yes. Uh, we thought. Yes. We decided that we're going to scrap all research. Uh -huh. So many soft funded stuff that demand our attention, that HR and all of that, we're going to fire all research stuff. Uh -huh. When the funding runs out, they don't have any jobs anymore. Right. So, so, so we stop the research. And we would do that because. What was our logic? Um, the, it's the split. Oh, right. Yes. So, yeah. So we just—it's too labor intensive, yeah. and we're going to become a teaching institution. Yes. Quite right. fantastic. Okay. The next one was that we want to teach digitally. We want to increase our digitization aggressively and expand. Okay. okay. And to fund that, we're going to sell all our buildings and spaces, uh, our current infrastructure. You can see this happening, right? You can see universities around the world. Making this decision. No, those, that's the part. That's it. Either four. Research, mass in numbers, public funding, and digitalization. Okay, so this is the how you kill yourself as a university version, right? <laughs> and maybe I'm just embellishing the first story here. If we enrich the story, what happens to your top researchers pretty quickly? They, they leave, right? And they're actively poached. And they go, so this is part of telling the story. This is what happens, right? So what happens to your industry relationships? They start to rapidly deteriorate, and in fact, some of the research contracts are prematurely terminated. Mm -hmm. Can you see the story being told? Mm -hmm. This is how it plays out. Okay, so there's a view of how you kill a university. And you can see the temptation for doing exactly that. It's all around us. It's not a far-fetched scenario. Where's the next guys that say we die slowly? Who was that? Tell me why it took longer. Just give me the, the difference if you think about that scenario which we've embellished a little bit. Why, why does it take some universities longer to die? So the high endowment institutions simply burn their assets over time. That's one reason, okay? Also, it, it's what I was referring to earlier is that with your full tank of petrol analogy is a highly credible university that's been around for a hundred and plus years has a big pull factor. Right. And as quality declines because of some of the, the criteria that we'll discuss yeah. in a moment, it takes time for the credibility to bend. Yeah. So, so <laughs> demographics is one of those things that just, uh, that if you don't pay attention to it, it surprises you. So you play in a certain demographic bubble, let's say, but you don't notice that in 15 years that's going to start doing that. A similar thing may be that you, you, you misread technology trends or you, um, you don't stay abreast of uh, political and social developments. I'm going to ask the sudden success first and then ask what slows it down. Is that a reasonable thing to do? Okay, so tell us, how do we get in and we just go boom, it absolutely flies. Right, right. So the context-driven issue was super high on your thrive quickly scenario. Yeah. And you said that to increase the speed, the structures are so archaic that we may have to in fact split them. 
in order to increase the speed. That's very interesting. I would say that's against a lot of common logic. But I can see the argument. I can see the argument. Okay, so you give us an argument about what, what do you think we, we got there, but it, it took a long time. Why? What, what made it take so much time? The value of the time is that you learn, right? Yeah. So you go, you come back, you learn, you do again, you come back, you, you, you up it like that all the time. And the learning is the, the value you get, and that's why in the end, in your scenario, you succeed. Because you learned. Yes. So the argument for the slow success, in the, 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 the argument for the success is the learning. The argument for the slow is the structural shifts. I think the other thing, um, we've got lots of ideas here, but the yeah. other main big thing is is the how dependent we must be on, on public funding. And we will gradually have to make ourselves more independent of public Right. Very nice. I like how you've referred to the, the funding dimension, the process structural dimension, the uh, human capital dimension, and the beneficiary dimension, the student dimension. So a very nice kind of broad scope. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. It's a complex thing. We have to decide. We've done a huge amount of work to get what to what might seem to you a very simple little set of variables, uh, but I can assure you we have no idea what, what those might be, as obvious as they might seem at this stage of the process to you. I would like to invite you to please you know, advise us of your insights um, in the shower or in the traffic <laughs> as they strike you, and uh, please do share it with us. Please send me an email. Um, I'll, I'll share my email address with you uh, if that's of interest to you. It's, uh, it's Monet or Doris. Doris likes lots of emails. Um, at Institute for Futures Research at Stenemosh University dot academic dot South Africa. I'm going to say thank you so much. I've absolutely loved having you here. Thank you so much for coming. It's been an absolute treat.